what better session to have on this day when we're all a bit tired, a bit burnt out, got to, feel, to have a really intense conversation about changing carbon accounting and how we measure what matters. This is the kind of shit we've got to get to at this level. Come on. This is what it's all about. So it was my enormous pleasure and indeed kind of quite a lot of fun to invite two of my friends to come and join us. So we've got Kaya Axelton of Oxford Net Zero and Shante Harris of Unia. Do I pronounce that right? Unoya. Unoya. Um, and we're going to have a conversation about measuring what matters. Now this is quite a tight session because I basically squeezed it in between two other sessions. So we've only got 40 minutes, so we're going to go powerfully fast, which is also great on, de on, the, on the sixth week of Climate Week. So, <laughs> um, shall I do a few framing thoughts yeah. and then hand over to you? Please. You have the clicker. Do we have a clicker? There's a clicker somewhere. Someone will find a clicker and we'll bring you a clicker. Um, there are various people who are now big, getting quite busy and running around. In fact, someone who doesn't work at Solutions House has brought you a clicker. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is, the, this is the radical collaboration we need to solve climate change. You, madam, are an example to us all. So, um, uh, Kaya and Shanti and I have had a number of conversations around the incredibly positive and overall progressive and impactful um, uh, way in which much of the early parts of sustainability, much of the early conversations, much of the early innovative work of sustainability has now become compliance-based. That's what we need, because there is an enormous number of organizations in the world, not all of them are the most progressive, not all of them are the most innovative, and actually they need a framework and even regulation and requirements in order to set the kind of targets and to measure those targets in a consistent and applicable way. So all power to scope one, two, and three, and everybody on this panel is all power to scope one, two, and three. However, even if every single company who has committed to going net zero across scopes one, two, and three within a reasonable time scale does it, we are still fucked. <laughs> it's cute when British people swear. So. <laughs> we need to decarbonize society. We need societal level emissions reductions. We need to be looking at parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We need to be thinking about how do we actually help companies need to be taking a role beyond their own boundaries and into society and becoming those solutions makers that actually companies are good at doing. Now, there's a few reasons for that. One is the very, very big um, requirement for us to decarbonize society beyond those parts that technically fit within the inventory of climate change. Secondly, is because we actually need a little bit of a narrative change around corporate responsibility. For those people who are very compliance driven for what I call managerial sustainability, managerial sustainability is all about target setting, is about processes, about working through um, uh, incremental improvements over time. We definitely need that, but it's only 50% of what we need. The other half of what we need is entrepreneurial sustainability. We need risk, solutions, inventions that we're not quite sure whether they're going to pull off yet. We need boldness and courage, and we need that entrepreneurial mindset of getting out there and solving a problem and trying different things in, in order to make it happen on climate change. And at the moment, we're about 80% managerial sustainability and about 20% entrepreneurial sustainability and we need to rebalance that so that and that requires us to not just put all of our measurement and structure thinking into the entrepreneurial sustainability we also need ways to measure to incentivize and to reward companies for doing the entrepreneurial work as well now we are not the only people talking about this there's fantastic work that the exponential roadmap initiative have done there's lots of fantastic work being done on enabled emissions reductions and on other interventions, but what 
primarily Kai and her team have done is start to bring some of this together into a structure. And then she very, very, very kindly invited me to be part of some of that conversation because uh, I'm good at sound bites. And so, we, and so we worked together and we managed to get a couple of weeks ago an article in the Harvard Business Review around this topic. And by the way, just a hint, how you get an article in Harvard Business Review is you go on LinkedIn, you find a Harvard Business Review <laughs> editor and you email him with the t subtitle, Carbon Accounting Article Stroke Not Boring. <laughs> and it turns out it, it's genuinely and absolutely it's true. Genius. And he opened it and he read it and he said, you're right, it's not boring, we'll run it. <laughs> so, um, so this is just the beginning of a conversation. That HBL article was the tip of an iceberg of really exciting conversations that many, many, many folks are having. So um, I'm, I'm really excited about us balancing out the current compliance work on CSRD and all the other um, uh, acronyms with something which is more inventive, transformational, and societal level on sustainability. So I'm going to hand over to Kai, who actually knows what we're talking about. Okay, first of all, how dare you? <laughs> this was all Sully's idea. She invited me to a workshop about this kind of thinking like two years ago, and it absolutely changed the way that um, I think about sustainability. So thank you for your ideas as well as your comms, a genius and ability to get the attention of HBR editors. Um, so I'm just going to, you know, like acknowledge the landscape that we're in. We're in this beautiful Manhattan week where we're running around the streets, like hugging each other and feeling positive and probably a bit of despair, but at least it's like collective despair. And we know that, that you know, that's a bubble, that's an eco chamber. And, um, and at the same time, there's this kind of uh, right wing or um, kind of a small corner of loud voices that have been raising um, challenges with the ESG landscape. Um, Elon Musk, which is, was the hook of our HBR article, we protested, but it was a good hook in the end, um, you know, famously said, why does Tesla have a lower ESG score than Total or, or any of these energy companies or heavy industry? Um, it offers climate solutions. And um, our net zero tracker just came out, and they still haven't set a climate target. So that's why, Elon. But. Um, there is kind of a point to the fact that we are not rewarding impact. And I think there are plenty of other better examples than Tesla, you know, green growth startups from some of the panelists we saw just before this session, people who are really, truly offering climate solutions, um, and we're not really capturing that leadership in the way that we write um, climate standards, whether that be science-based targets or the greenhouse gas protocol doesn't always capture that because that would be intervention, accounting. And so we thought, you know, are we measuring what matters? Well, we're measuring some of what matters. We absolutely need to, it's not a replacement, like we absolutely need to have companies reduce their emissions, otherwise we've kind of, you know, cut off our own legs there. But we thought we could publish some articles too. If the ESG Backlash gets to publish articles, so can we. So. Um, my colleague, Matilda Becker, raise your hand in the back. Um, she uh, worked with me and drafted this amazing outline of a paper that I've never kind of seen submitted a paper quite like this to a, you know, a journal, a journal of carbon management. And we explored the uh, sort of three spheres of influence that we think companies can be excited about and responsible for that are wider system interventions that they can take, um, which are not necessarily captured in your traditional GHG inventory. And we were trying to figure out, because there's a lot of great thinking on this already. I mean, probably many of you have been to so many sustainability events talking about scope four or scope X. So that would be what we're calling sphere A, your sphere of influence on your product. Many companies have been doing an amazing job of going so far above and beyond with these demand aggregation coalitions, purchasing stuff at a green premium that doesn't get rewarded in the GHG inventory, purchasing credits to contribute to the global net zero mitigation and adaptation challenge. And then thirdly, of course, acknowledging that in their transition plans there are tons of external dependencies where if policy doesn't change they won't be able to meet their targets and so they're stepping outside 
again, of their scopes and into their sphere of influence by doing public-private partnerships and doing political or policy advocacy and engagement. And so we thought we would call these spheres intentionally, actually we solely came up with the spheres language because then you're not netting these two figures. The first thing a savvy business person is gonna do is say, can I calculate all this up and then erase or net or offset my inventory emissions? No, this whole idea will not get off the ground if we do that. This is in addition to, but also critically there is a relationship, you're not gonna be able to meet your targets without doing these, I think. That's our theory anyway, and we'd love to discuss it with all of you today. So thanks. Thank you so much, Kai. This is also a round of applause, Kai. You did brilliant. Thank you. And I find this incredibly exciting because whilst there is a lot of thinking underneath the spheres, there's also a lot of empty space and places where like the pen is yet to write on defining some of this, on identifying some of this, on actually implementing it and seeing whether this works in practice, in using it to goal set and to take action. Because whilst measurement is incredibly important and being able to report and be held accountable is incredibly important, so does doing shit. And so what we're really hoping is that actually some of this fears thinking helps energize some of the entrepreneurial thinking people inside companies, some of the marketers, some of the strategy teams, some of the product development teams inside companies to actually start seeing a role for themselves, not just in saving energy, but actually in saving societal level carbon. So Shanti, you're an entrepreneur yourself. Um, how does some of this sort of resonate with how you've been thinking? Yeah, it's really interesting. Hi, everyone. Shante Harris, founder and managing partner of Unoya Group. We're a climate investment advisory and portfolio management firm that focuses on corporate, individual, and institutional investment to really fill the financing gap. Um, I know a lot of us think about the financial gap for how we go from goals to actual implementation. So we're building the strategies with folks who have the bread actually allocated, right, for uh, putting money into different projects and ensuring that it flows into the things that matter. Um, a little bit more about my background, I've worked across a lot of different sectors. So government, corporate, um, and more recently, venture capital, and climate technology. Uh, so I ran a venture studio for about two and a half years aimed at de-risking early stage climate technologies. We launched that in 2020 um, and deployed capital. Um, we were oftentimes the first check into think some of the most scientific PhD focused solutions that really were about business model innovation and deep technology. Um, they all went on to raise additional capital that was corporate, public and private, so a true blended finance model. Um, and to date, they've all raised over $30 million across public and private investment. A number of them are breakthrough fellows. Um, and I'm saying all of this really just to say that where I see a lot of the opportunity and challenge for emerging technologies and solutions, particularly now, is you know they need to scale. And so we've given a lot of early stage solutions money over the past four or five years. Um, and where they're at now is not only you know having proved out the model and the product, but they're ready to be integrated into corporate supply chains and they want to be a part of the procurement processes, right? Whether that's government or corporates, um, but there's still a gap between not only how they finance that, what is oftentimes biz dev process, having sold into corporates on behalf of startups and also having worked with corporates to buy services or products from startups, it can take time because a lot of us are learning together. So two years ago, I actually moderated a panel about corporate integration of climate solutions because a lot of the solutions that are needed for big corporates to reach their goals are being built by the hungry entrepreneurs that I've had the privilege of working with. And I know when we started talking about this session, a lot of what I was hoping to bring to the table was really the, um, I think the narrative and the, the piece that oftentimes is missed with early stage entrepreneurship, which is founders are already doing this. So they may not be calling it ESG because they don't have the time to you know, do the really intensive reporting. We worked with all our founders and actually paid for them to work with Pollution Prevention Institute here in New York so that they could create that greenhouse gas emission um, narrative that is certainly needed, but otherwise they 
they would have to fund themselves. And so in a lot of ways, what we're seeing is um, founders and technologists that are already building the solutions and doing this simultaneously, but they're so heads down and building because this is really hard, really capital intensive, um, that they may be and oftentimes are giving metrics to their investors and corporates who might ask for them, but they're also not getting the credit for that, right? And so they're not getting additional funding for building a solution that is more uh, climate friendly. And many times when you look at the venture capital ecosystem, there's actually no standards across venture capital either for how to measure impact, whether it's a climate tech startup or not. And I know there are startup solutions like Kara. I know we talked about Miriam. She used to be a VC investor and she's building sort of the ESG standard for startups. Um, but really, you know, where I sit, it's how do we also quantify value and ensure that those companies are getting the credit and the support because they're doing it honestly oftentimes better than corporates, even if they're not you know mandated or providing that same level of mm -hmm. reporting um, and you know share out in terms of insights. Brilliant. So what listening to you speak, it reminds me of being in San Francisco earlier this year at a big green tech um, conference. And there's a lot of plant-based food entrepreneurs. There was a lot of what somebody called fuel-free personal mobility, which I think means bicycle. Um, <laughs> Yeah, didn't quite get my head around that one. And of course, a lot of grid-ready renewables companies. Um, and some, it was a very intense conversation looking for unicorn companies and looking for the first um, green decacorn, which is a 10 billion uh, company and a terrible word. Um, and none of them could have a net zero commitment because these are radical growth companies. And I want them to be radical growth companies and I will fight for them to be radical growth companies because they are fungible solutions to currently hard to abate sectors or um, carbon intensive sectors but being a radical growth company even if societally you're going to bring down emissions means that your net zero targets are not going to look good. <laughs> so tell us a little bit because I know that you've had an experience of some of that in the global south with some of the Global South entrepreneurs and what they need from some of measuring what matters. Yeah, it really was um, teaching on an executive um, business course in Oxford where this is an amazing course where different entrepreneurs from like all across the continent come and spend a week in Oxford and then spend a week in South Africa together. Um, and really like they were teaching me was like how it should be. Um, and, and I was kind of talking about like the various forms of net zero standardization and reporting and they were kind of sharing their challenges with the reporting landscape that they were experiencing um, and they were like this doesn't speak to us at all our theory of change our model it doesn't show us what value we have or help us show the world the work that we're doing and I was like oh my god so it was such good timing to pair up with you and the team had been thinking about this quite a lot. We get a lot of kind of pushback as well from, we, we do a lot of work with um, youth and civil society. Matilda is about to start a project that is like look, specifically working with global youth um, to integrate their perspectives into net zero policy and standards because they're like, you know, going to be most affected by it and are not at all in um, at the table in those discussions because they tend to be techno bureaucratic. And, and what we're hearing hearing a lot of the time is like where's our where's in, where's the inspiration you know where's the innovation if young people are getting into businesses these days they want those businesses to be sustainability minded and they want to they're getting into it because they've heard of some great entrepreneur who changed the world and we have forgot to ask we've asked companies what their footprints are but we forgot to ask them what their climate legacies will be. Mm -hmm. So no wonder we're having a hard time mobilizing CEOs. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think, our opportunity to shift the landscape and bring inspiration, inject, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull from like the US elections, not, get to, not to get political, like inject some <laughs> joy back into yeah. the ESG landscape. And I think that will ultimately totally um, 
like mollify a lot of the the BS that we're dealing with. <laughs> but let's just sit with the BS for one second. Okay. So I have a theory, which is that everything that oil and gas touches gets fucked up. So like, actually, there's a, I'm, there's lots of interesting and positive things do. that happen around offsetting, particularly around uh, Global South, particularly around getting a massive amount of money through to... Um, uh, uh, the nature. Um, there's also a lot of great deep problems with it. And one of the problems is the oil and gas adopted it. And so we all stopped believing in it. Mm. Um, and that basically any of these frameworks that oil and gas decides is a way for them to get out of jail free, suddenly something which might have had the core of something good gets gets ruined because they greenwash the hell out of it. So how are we going to prevent, and this is a question to you, Kai, how are we going to prevent the oil and gas companies going, don't look at our scopes, look at our spheres. Look at all the money we put into our spheres. Just, just don't look over here, look over here. How are we going to prevent this idea, which I love and have been part of developing, being massively deployed for greenwash? Mm. I mean, greenwashing is something we that's going to happen if there's no standards, right? Mm -hmm. And so if we're not at the table defining the methodology, defining sort of um, saying, no, you can't net those two things together, first of all, like we're, we're not even asking to be at the table yet. Mm -hmm. And so there's a very good chance that, you know, maybe someone hearing this discussion will be like, that's a great idea. Let me define that. Let me be a leader in that. Let me. And then that, that could kill the idea. Mm -hmm. um, so I think just being at the table, like working it into the standards in the way and, and developing the safeguards. You know, I was pitching this to some, some folks inside companies and they were like, it was amazing. They were getting so excited. And then one of them was like, oh, no. Oh no, <laughs> you know, they were seeing how some of their business minded folks inside their company were going to run with it. And so, this is why I want our community to work on it now. Um, so we and I think some of the safeguards, like not netting, is like the, the obvious safeguard. Um, and also, just pointing out that you're asking and answering fundamentally different research questions. How do I reduce my operational emissions is very different to how do I make my impact in society. And it's helping companies understand their sort of role as a system player. Mm -hmm. And that can probably unearth a lot of unnamed bad stuff yeah. that is going on. Yeah. So we need compliance and we need creativity, but we need compliance to make sure that creativity doesn't get in any way sort of bastardized or greenwashed. It's like, it's like emojis of us. <laughs> <laughs> Compliance, creativity. <laughs> also unfair, you are very creative. Um, uh, uh, and I get to do a bit of compliance sometimes. But yes, um, Shanti, how, how can we incentivize more entrepreneurial thinking inside sustainability? How can we make sure that as we're all focused on our reporting and our requirements, that we don't suddenly ignore the burgeoning solutions economy? Yeah, I think don't ignore them is my simple response to that. Um, but a more complex response is if you're an investor, if you're a corporate, if you're thinking through all of these, oftentimes without proper team members and budget, and there's a whole host of people who are building solutions that want to be your thought partner. So I know sometimes we tend to focus on just the Silicon Valley backed companies that look a certain way. I've worked with them as well, but also startups are coming from all over the world. We mentioned the Global South. We've mentioned, or we haven't mentioned, but there are many founders that are actually coming from the frontline communities, right? And have been for a long time, but they're not the ones you're gonna read about in tech, in tech crunch. So also putting the onus on the audience and the people here to do your homework and understand that the one article you read and tech crunch that week or whatever you know tech reporter you might be following may have some of that information but not all of that information and I'll give you an example there's a female founder that we funded through our venture studio model not only is she using AI to take textile waste millions of textile waste that otherwise would go to a landfill and upcycling it into new designs that luxury brands are actually using so they're not sending their textile waste to the landfill to begin with like a true proactive solution Solution. She's also hiring climate refugees and paying them 400 times more than they would anywhere else um, in the world in an existing corporate. So I think when we talk about it, she's not a nonprofit. She's a for-profit company. They are profitable. And her challenge is that she goes to VCs and they're like, oh, how incredible. You're having impact. We, that's not really our, our vibe, right? Like, let's go talk to 
or you should go talk to a philanthropy. And she goes to philanthropy and they're like, oh, but you're not a nonprofit, right? And so in a lot of ways, we're asking founders to do what we haven't done in the ecosystem, which is actually think in a multidisciplinary way. So that means that they can be our case studies and they should be our case studies. And the reality is she's solving a real problem for real corporates while also simulta simultaneously, excuse me, solving a big problem that we're all experiencing, which is climate refugees, which unfortunately we know is going to continue to be a challenge. So where are those business models that are already doing that? How do we learn from them? How do we pour lots of resources into them so that they can scale? And I think a lot of this conversation is also about what have business practices historically been? Because I know we're talking about you know Elon's frustration that he's not getting credit, but Elon also had a big lawsuit for treating his black employees terribly, right? And so in the yeah. future, are we also you know ensuring that the businesses we're building are building different practices that are truly regenerative, that value workers in the communities that they care about or they say they care about? And I know the companies that I'm working with are doing that. They're asking, how do we exit to community? Are there other models where we don't have to IPO? Like, what does it mean to really build a co-ownership model for solutions as they scale to Series D, E? You have founders that are actually giving away their stock now to community organizations so they can have self-sustaining models where they're not consistently fundraising wow. from philanthropy. Um, but I think oftentimes the investment and the corporate doors are closed to them. So we'll talk about highlighting founders, but then the founders won't be in the room, right? And so we need to make sure that they're in the room to share the narratives of what they're already doing. Let's talk about that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Remind me, what's her name and her company? Uh, Shelly Zhu. She's actually based in New York. Shelly Zhu. Yeah. So take, for example, a large corporate who might be doing anything from seed funding through to multi-series um, investments. Yes, yeah, someone's having far too much fun back there and they need to shut up. <laughs> Try it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. To multi-series investments. At the moment, there's no way for a large corporate to get credit for that, to be reflective of that. No. Where would somebody investing in that business, which sphere would that go into? <laughs> Ooh, I mean, so I guess if they were co-owned, then it would be the product sphere because it would yeah. be their product. And if there was an investment model, it would be sort of the, the purchasing yep. space. It's how they're using their strategic climate fund, mm -hmm. whether that's through catalytic funding or different financing mechanisms to support good stuff. And that's why I'm so excited about this, because it actually gives a framework of incentives mm -hmm. for companies to put this within their car, their climate plan mm -hmm. rather than it being this almost slightly philanthropic thing that's done over here. Right. Brilliant. Right, we have about nine minutes and I suspect there might be a few questions. <laughs> so if anyone has questions, please shoot, jump up. I'm hoping, yes, we have our, our, our mic. There's a question here at the front and then, so there's two questions at the front. So it's just, yeah, okay. And then we'll come to you. Thank you so much for the interesting panel. My name is Anna. I've worked in a company carbon footprint calculation. Um, I've built a software kind of for it together with a company. Um, I'm wondering, how are you thinking about putting this framework into action through policy, through an actionable tool? So kind of uh, what's your approach to making this actionable? Right. We're actually going to take another question at the same time to make use of time. So just well done. Again, great collaboration, please. Thank you so much. Uh, I love this framework. I think we're in a moment where we're redefining everything, so it's time to get to new standards. Uh, I'm interested, I assume that the avoided emission is about consumer use, right? So, right, okay. The political advocacy is something that I find it super interesting, but also very hard to measure, because like what determines what is enough, what is not too much, what are the uh, appropriate political way of influencing. So I'm just curious about how you think about it, knowing that you haven't actually done it yet, but just yeah. in your head. So um, I'm going to say one word on that because I completely freaked um, Kaya out last year at COP by saying that someone had sat down and come to me to talk about lobbied emissions, which is where you take a piece of policy that ha that is being proposed, you calculate the likely emissions reductions or emissions increases by that piece of policy passing or not passing, and then you slice it up by the companies that have advocated for it or tried to block it. Kaya was not a fan of the idea of lobby emissions. <laughs> Maybe I like it now. I don't know. As 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 being something which 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 might be 
there, there are ways to measure impact that doesn't always mean calculating yeah. a, ca yeah. a carbon and calculating an emission. And that's one of the reasons why we're calling it spheres of influence and spheres of impact, not spheres of emissions, because there are ways to, to take into account, and some fantastic people have done work on good policy, bad policy, policy that is um, uh, uh, likely to be progressive for climate action and policy mm -hmm. that's likely to be progressive of um, climate action. And I think Unilever's new commitment around, you know, a lot was said about Unilever's, you know, walking back from sustainability. But actually, in the mo most recent commitment, they made a massive new commitment around how they're going to back policy on sustainability. Yeah. And that, for me, is very much within the sphere's angle. They're actually actively saying, this is what we're going to stand for and this is what we're not. And also, this is what we're going to stand for in the... Um, business groups we're part of, and this is what we're not. And this is Sphere's activity for me. Perhaps you could take the question about what next? How do we actually turn this into a standard? Yeah, I mean, so I like to like do work where I can actually do the work. Um, and, and so I work on um, net zero standards, as I'm sure most people in this room are aware, we're undergoing a huge update to um, the greenhouse gas protocol, uh, the ISO net zero standard, and SBTI, among others. And so um, I'm, I'm working on socializing, maybe actually some of you in the room are in those processes, like I'm working on socializing this view. Um, a few years back, I interviewed companies, and what the title of the paper was um, Net Zero for My Business or My Business for Net Zero. And that second pillar is what we're trying to introduce. So basically, a second way of claiming net zero alignment, but to the global net zero goal, in addition to your organizational net zero goal, to create space. And, and frankly, I think to resolve some of the really fierce and ugly debates we've been seeing because we have a single metric itis problem with net zero credit. Don't, oh, certain credits don't belong. Oh, you know, products doesn't belong. Whatever. Then, like, people are fighting to get that into an in inventory, and it doesn't really fit there. There's an integrity battle instead of us all saying, like, actually, here's the destination, and let's do both. So I, I'm really working on socializing that, both on a political level, getting people excited about this idea, and also working through it with me um, in a collaborative way um, and writing it into the standards. I want to answer the question a little bit about the political sphere because we have some great work. Like each of these spheres is really just a nice repackaging yeah. of like work that's already gone on. Um, the WBCSD has great avoided emissions guidance. Um, the, there's tons of work on the purchasing sphere, right? Like all of your you know carbon credit stuff and and more. Um, and the political advocacy sphere is a space where Influence Map and We Mean Business are doing amazing work. And so I think what we'll do is draw from all of that. Um, the paper that Matilda and I wrote um, kind of cites all that work, so you can find that in the Journal of Carbon Management. And the last thing I'll say about the operationalization of all of this is this is also, you know, Soli's thinking around there's spheres within the spheres, and those are spheres of certainty. Yeah. Maybe your inner sphere of certainty is where you're like, I did that thing. Like, I'm pretty sure through some kind of causal link, I process traced that, I can show quantitatively even that that was our impact, and I am so proud of that, and maybe, you know, we others joined in with that. And then there are, like, in the world, which is messy, I'm a qualitative researcher, we work with a lot of co-variables that are always interacting with each other. You're like, I don't know if I did that thing, but we, we tried and we made an effort on that and this is our contribution to that. And um, you don't necessarily have to report that in terms of a total emissions number. We can say maybe here is a target, we wanted to get this many trucks off the road in this region or we wanted to help pass policy. And it's okay because that is helping companies outline their theory of change, which has frankly been a little bit watery and murky yeah. till now. Um, that's, that there's, I, this is absolutely core to some of this idea of the spheres, is that there might be dark blue spheres where you have some hard numbers. There might be light blue spheres where you've got some indicative numbers. And there might be some aquamarine spheres <laughs> where you've got directional or insightful information. So you might notice a few sort of fake movie posters up around Futera, up around Solutions House. Futera does a lot of work with the film and TV industry. I've just taken a new role announced yesterday with UNFCCC to help engage in the film and TV industry. We are a very, very long way from being able to account for in 
or in any way prove causality around content that might be on in social media or might be on film or TV, encouraging people to take action on sustainability. Just because we can't yet count that carbon doesn't mean it's not incredibly important that that happens and that we don't calculate what we're doing on it and we don't set targets on it and we don't review it and we don't set goals for it. So that for me would be a very light blue aquamarine sphere in terms of where we are on the calculation and then perhaps some of the stuff that is a little bit um, more around this is a fungible climate solution, this is a piece of, this is a renewable energy tech, we can absolutely prove causality here, would be a dark blue, a sort of navy sphere <laughs> in terms of our certain around it and that's something which some of the companies in this room are already beginning to think about and already begin beginning to account for as Kai said what we're doing here in many ways is aggregating thinking that many other people have done and which we're extremely grateful for into a sort of framework that perhaps gives us a right to, to speak about it we probably have time for one more question if there's anybody else burning for one In which case, I'm going to take the time to ask Shante a question, <laughs> which is, um, Shante, the work that you've done um, over such a period of time with very much in the entrepreneurial sustainability space, um, if we're going to have the pendulum swing back maybe to 50-50 from compliance still absolutely core and central to what we do, but they're also being this entrepreneurial, innovation, inventive type space. How can we best serve entrepreneurs which are not just thinking about the parts from running carbon outside, but entrepreneurs who are thinking about the intersectional issues with race, with gender, and with equity? Yeah, I think capacity is always a big one. Startups need advisors. They need people to sit on their boards. If you're doing all of the reporting already, maybe just reaching out to a company and saying, hey, this is my expertise. Can I assist with some of that work? Um, I also feel like venture isn't always the most inviting space for many people who've never been a part of it. But there are funds thinking about this. One of my good friends, she's been at a fund called Regeneration VC, and she's been leading a lot of the impact metrics on behalf of the portfolio. Um, so that's also a role that I think we're going to see a lot more of. And I think to the extent that there are people who have deep expertise in this area and want to go in-house with the portfolio and support them. Um, there's a woman named uh, Michelle Demers who runs Boundless Impact, and she's doing a lot of incredible work around techno-economic analysis and also just general GHG reporting with startups to not only add capacity, but create real reporting metrics that they can use for investors, for governments, for any other folks who have mandates and might be trying to figure out where does this solution go. And the last thing I'll say is one of the projects we got to work on last year was in partnership with the foundation where we created a new framework and tool for startups um, that's basically a system science tool. So actually measuring the impact outside of climate that they're having as they deploy, um, especially as we're seeing the greenhouse gas reduction fund money come online. For those who don't know, that's 20 $27 billion going into frontline communities. How do you not only measure the project itself that's bringing renewable energy or improving the, the lives of people due to air quality and all these other factors, but what does it mean to measure that and give them credit and money right as they're doing it so that it's not just climate, it's also impact and we can see the two really working close together. And the last thing I'll say, I know we have to wrap up, is it was really fun doing it with um, PhDs and engineers because as we were running through the, the model, it's called Climate Tech System Science Readiness, all of them looked at me and were like, we've never had systems and impact language that works for an engineer or a technical person. And I think we have to think about it in that way. How is the language molded for the people that are truly building the super, you know, whether it's deep tech or science solutions that may not be experts in this? Love it. So as many of you all know, I talk a lot about the solutions economy and how we need to move from an extractive and exploitative economy, which is the basis of a great deal of how we've been doing carbon accounting right now, going, can we account for being slightly less extractive and exploitative, to moving to a solutions economy where we are measuring and incentivizing the amount, the scale, and the impact of solutions that companies are bringing in. And I do believe that the rest
rest of this century will be much more focused around being um, uh, a solutions economy. Now, before we say thank you to this panel, I have to just note that the next panel starts in nine minutes. What that means is if you are here for the Environmental Defence Fund panel that starts in nine minutes, keep your seat. It's a very oversubscribed panel, you're going to lose your seat. If you're not subscribed for the next one, I'm so sorry, but we're going to say move on, get on with your climate week because we've got to get a whole lot of more people back in here. So please join me in thanking Kaya and thanking Shanti and also thanking me because I love this too. Thank you.